department there. Sir, and I'm taking care of... Keep it like this. We can't hear you here. Okay, sir. Is it clear? Yeah. Can you keep it like yes, this? Yes, yes. So, I'm taking care of daycare at Max Hospital Panchil Park. So, at Max Hospital Panchil Park, we have daycare center. Most of you are not aware of that. We are doing a lot of daycare surgeries there. So, I will tell you a little bit of daycare surgeries and what is daycare all about. So, daycare surgery, ambulatory surgery, outpatient surgery, office-based surgery, all these are synonyms. Patient getting admitted for 23 hours or less than 24 hours should not be considered as daycare surgery as these are short-stay surgery. The basic concept of daycare surgery is morning you come from home, you get your surgery or procedure done in the hospital and go back home before night. So there is no night stay in hospital. That's the basic concept of daycare surgery or daycare procedures. What's the trend worldwide? So approximately 65% of all elective procedures can be performed on daycare basis. Canada is leading in this. Approximately 87% of elective procedures are done on daycare basis. Unfortunately, for India, we don't have any data. Role of daycare. Daycare is not all about surgeries. We can do a lot of other procedures also like chemotherapy, endoscopies, blood transfusion, pain management, radiology therapies and so many things we can keep on doing on daycare basis. Why patient hates to stay in hospital? Basically what they want to do, they can't do in hospital. No one likes to stay in hospital. Longer they stay in hospital, they feel as if they are waiting for their end point to come. So, no one wants to stay in hospital. Daycare is the alternative for that. Advantage of daycare for the patients, it reduces the risk of cross-infection. You are not staying in the hospital overnight, so chances of cross-infection is very less. Less stressful, especially for pediatric patients and elderly patients. They don't want to stay in hospital. They want to go home in their comfortable atmosphere. They will heal their disease better in comparison to hospital. It is cost effective, less waiting period. Patients are mobilized early and motivated to reach home as early as possible. Advantage to hospital. So high bed occupancy rate can be there. One bed can be used for two patients for same day so that bed occupancy rate will be high, patient turnover will be high, risk of minimal cancellation as it happens in bigger hospitals because of X, Y, Z reason. Some reason they will give and they will cancel the case for the day. So all those things happens very minimal or almost nil for daycare procedures. High patient satisfaction rate is one of the most important thing for this. There are different plans for daycare unit. Our hospital at Max Hospital Panchipa, we are freestanding self-contained unit. So there are different designs of daycare. What we practice at Max Hospital Panchil Park is race, race track uh, daycare design. In that what happens? Patient for surgical OPD comes to PAC clinic, that is pre-anesthesia checkup clinic, and on the day of admission, patient get admitted, goes to pre-operative area, then from pre-operative area, patient goes to operation theater, from post-operation theater, post-operative area, and patient is discharged from post-operative area on the same day. What we do in pre-operative or pre-anesthesia checkup, generally we ask for brief history, do general physical examination, we ask for relevant investigation, and we give few instructions a day prior to procedure, what to take care of. Patient selection is very important for daycare procedures. All patients look same, but they are different. Patient selection criteria. ASA, Anesthesia Society of Anesthesiologists, grading 1 and 2 are the ideal patient for daycare procedure, but we take on uh, the basis of procedure and the surgeon who is going to operate the, the patient. We can take up to 3 or 4 also. Duration of procedure is also very important. We should not take any patient whose we are expecting duration of surgery is more than two hours. So there are few exclusive criteria also. If you are suspecting 
excessive blood loss, we should not be taking that patient as daycare procedure. Severe post-operative pain, if you are suspecting, you should not take that patient in daycare procedure. And most important, if a patient is willing to stay overnight, we have a lot of patients who will say, you know, I don't want to go home. We want to stay in hospital for a day or two, we will take rest and then we will go home. So those patients are for the exclusive criteria for daycare procedures. What are the procedures we are doing at Max Hospital Panchi Park or generally than at daycare? Laparoscopic cholecystectomy, very often we are doing laparoscopic hernia, MIPH is minimal invasive procedure for hemorrhoids, circumcision, laser fistula, fissure, uh, superficial tumors, breast surgery, INDs and all those procedures we are doing on uh, general surgery basis. Orthopedics, all orthoscopic surgeries, spine also we are doing, carpal tunnel release, simple open reduction internal fixation as we have CM facility there so we can perform that procedure also. Close reduction and dislocation of joints. Pediatric surgery, inguinal hernia, hydrocell, tongue tie release, circumcision, lump, bump, all these excision are done on daycare basis for pediatric patients. We have very important center there, that is IVF center, IVF and Shield Park. There we are doing all the high-end IVF procedures like ICSI, IVF, uh, microscopic sperm extraction, and uh, routine procedures definitely we are doing there. So dental procedure, a lot of dental pediatric patients are coming to us saying that in Delhi, there are very few centers which are providing general anesthesia for dental procedures for pediatric patients. Our center is one of those. So Dr. Ashwarya Verma, I don't know how many of you know her. So she is one of our leading uh, pedo dentists and she is doing a lot of procedures here. Multiple extraction of tooth, all these procedures can be done on local anesthesia as well as under general anesthesia also. Mostly whatever procedure I have mentioned here, we are doing under general anesthesia only. So ENT surgery, septoplasty, tonsil, rhinoplasty, mastoid, functional endoscopy, sinus surgery, and snore, DIS, e is drug induced sleep endoscopy. Ophtha, ophtha. We have very important ophtha, whatever ophtha surgery you can think, all those procedures are done at Max Hospital Panchi Park. Cataract surgery, all type of cataract surgeries, and retinal surgery, we have Dr. Nikhil Pal here, who is our leading retinal surgeon, who is doing a lot of complicated retinal, complicated surgeries. Corneal transplant we are doing there, squint surgery and refractive surgery. Plastic surgery, all plastic surgery, approximately 60 to 70 percent of all plastic surgery can be performed on daycare basis. So we are doing a lot of plastics also. So how we are managing there? Basically the approach and development of anesthesia and analgesia, the recent advances and the drugs, what we got nowadays, are very helpful to get those procedures done on daycare basis. So, faster recovery is there because our drugs are very short acting drugs. So, patient is almost out of anesthesia in approximately 15 to 20 minutes after the procedure. We start giving oral, we start allowing our patient orally approximately an hour of surgery. And what about recovery? Recovery is ongoing process. The recovery consists of three phases basically. One is once we have cut down the anesthetic agent and the reflexes are back to the normal. Second is when patient is almost ready to be discharged. And third is later recovery which happens at home. Once patient's all physiological status is back to the normal. Discharge criteria, we stick to this point. There is a alert score, we stick to this. So, our patients are discharged if they are fully awake, oriented to time, place, person, able to move all their four limbs on the command, vitals are stable, able to pass urine, able to walk without dizziness, minimal or no pain, minimal nausea, but there is no vomiting. So, if all these criteria are fulfilled, patients are ready to discharge. What is the key role of success? Teamwork. If there is good understanding between surgeon, anesthesiologist, nursing staff, manager, technical staff and support staff, we can work together and we can make the patient comfortable and we can discharge the patient on the same way. That's all from my side. Thank you.
Dear friends, so although Dr. Manish Rai usually जब वो induce कर देते हैं तो आपको पता नहीं लगता कितना time हो गया। तो उन्होंने ऐसा ही कुछ किया था। मैंने समझा कि पांच मिनट लगे थे। कोई ना कोई। But we enjoyed it, sir. It was all enjoyable. मुझे लगा लोग सुन रहे हैं मैं थोड़ा बोल दूँ। Sir, जब तक ये ना पता लगे। Keeping new sacks lights। नहीं नहीं, it was it was wonderful. We we were enlightened to listen to whatever you told. My single question, and I I wish if you are have having question to Dr. Manish. You can ask him one right now, just after my question. बाद में ना करने को चाहिए। मैं कहता हूँ एक छोटी सी बात है, फिर ये भी फ्री हो जाएगी, ड्रिंक ले सकते हैं। मैं ड्रिंक सबसे नहीं ले आऊँगा। अच्छा। डॉक्टर चाव खाना इसके बाद एक ना। सर मैं जहाँ सा अगर एक सवाल मेरा और एक सवाल किसी और का। बस। We will have it in the end. Okay. So that so that there is no confusion. ठीक है सर। तो अभी अभी after effect जो है खत्म होने वाला है। Next and who do you call? Doctor? Doctor Devrat. Doctor Devrat was a very important role in the Mahabharat. I don't go into detail. I have told him once before that I have told him about the Mahabharat. He is a known person. We have listened to him. A very good oncologist. Let us know what new he has to tell us. And then we have questions and answers. Dr. Tulsi, me and our all friends will inquire. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kalra. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan. And Devrath was Vishmadama. I always joke that Vishmadama never got married. I am married happily for 13 years. I have a daughter. So, this is the first time that we have a Mahabharata and Kurukshetra. We have a wedding. So, I think we have all faced very difficult times in the past few years. When I was in the past 25-30 years, I was in history, in the school, it was already B.C. and A.D. before Christ and Annie Domini. I think that today, B.C., D.C. and A.C. before Covid, during Covid and after Covid. But believe me, I am very happy to be here with all of you physically. I think, it somehow makes you believe that the bad times are over and uh, there is a new world coming in where we can still get to meet each other more frequently and you know, enjoy each other company. So, a uh, very uh, short talk today, metastatic breast cancer. I had a set of cases, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to present one case. So, we all know metastatic breast cancer is a huge issue in India. Breast cancer is one of the most common cancers. In women in India, nearly 2 lakh new cancer cases. Unfortunately, uh, overall, uh, we see 50 to 60 percent women presenting with advanced stages. It's slightly better in urban areas like Delhi, where we have more of early stage disease. And traditionally, you all know we divide these uh, cases based on ERPR routine expression. With ERPR expression, predicting response to hormone therapy, or to expression predictive of more aggressive disease and I am sure you would have seen these this slide as well. I have done a lot of presentations with you all and you would remember this slide. Um, again, just to reiterate, you know, 2013 I saw this lady, young patient, 45 year old, initially presented with swelling of feet, actually went to a friend of mine who is a physician at RMM and then they came to us saying that there is something wrong. He, she had an ultrasound which had liver lesions. Uh, initially refused a physical examination, but uh, eventually we did it and there was an ulcerated lesion in the breast. And PET scan was disseminated metastatic disease. Again, this is back uh, from 2013. And when we biopsied, it was uh, invasive ductal carcinoma and unfortunately it was HER2 positive disease. Now, uh, we know HER2 mu is a marker of aggressive disease. Uh, I am sure a lot of prominent medical oncologists, much senior to me, much more learned than me, have had the opportunity to talk to you and and uh, discuss how her to knew when we started targeting it. And this was a paper from 2005, Dennis come on, back 2001. So uh, where traditional chemotherapy was used to treat these patients, and most of these patients would survive for just about 15 months on an average. 
We realized that when you target this sertinue with a drug, and at that time Herceptin came in, which was trastuzumab. The combination of trastuzumab, which actually inhibited the hertinue, and hertinue is a growth factor receptor. So basically, it's a cellular protein expressed on the cell surface, which does not need a ligand dependent stimulus. So all of our cells will divide based on a chemical stimulation by the body. So this chemical is called a ligand. In a hertinue amplified tumor, this ligand independence comes in. So, the, irrespective of whether that chemical is stimulated by the rest of the body or not, the cell will divide. And that's what makes them more aggressive. And Herceptin actually hit that ligand, uh, hit that uh, the cell surface receptor. And we actually realize that the, the survival improved by five months. Now, again, oncology, we talk about months, and, and the rest of the world talks about years and years and years. And uh, I am often asked this question, but for us, it was a great leap of understanding where we realized that we actually were able to improve survival by 33%. And this is what we treated this patient with because that was the standard of care at that point of time. Combined the standard chemotherapy with this drug, prostuzumab. And within six months, this is how she was. Now, in the previous CMEs, I've told you, you know, we, uh, she eventually progressed. We treated her with second line, third line, fourth line. In 2020, we lost her. And we didn't lose her to breast cancer. We lost her to COVID. So I think that's the uh, that's the COVID pandemic playing out in our own all of our lives. I think we are all attached to our patients. I was really attached to her. We lost her. But I often ask this question: ki, what would have been my treatment strategy if she had presented in this day and era? You know, would trastuzumab with chemotherapy have been the standard? And again single slide, we now have another monoclonal antibody and I am sure all of us know about monoclonal antibodies again unfortunately due to COVID. But this is another drug which helps trastuzumab to further inhibit the growth of these cells. And in 2016 I think, 2016 we had this trial where for metastatic breast cancer we gave these patients chemotherapy with trastuzumab and pertuzumab and pertuzumab actually improved survival. So remember the median survival was 20 months in the 2001 study. Obviously, we had better scans, better CT scans, and then PET scans. So there was a stage migration also. But we realized that when we added pertuzumab, the survival is improved by another 15 months. So another 30% improvement in survival. And the median was started becoming 56.5 months. So had this patient come to me at this day and era, this is the combination I would have offered, and I would have said, on an average, there is a possibility that uh, you know you may survive for three, four, five years based on this data. And we are actually seeing these results in our day-to-day -day practice. Now came the advent of a new molecule called the antibody drug conjugate. The problem that we are facing with chemo and trastuzumab were these are two different drugs. So chemo was giving benefit, killing of the cells, and we all know chemo gives us side effects because. Uh, it will also affect normal cells. Herceptin is more targeted because it will only affect cells which are or two expressors in our body. Or two expressing cells are predominantly the tumor cell, breast cells, uh, some some myocytes in the heart, and therefore one of the known side effects of these drugs is cardiotoxicity, although not very common. So we said, what if we combine trastuzumab with the chemotherapy as a ligand? So it's a single molecule, and when the trastuzumab combines to the hertinue positive cell. The chemo is delivered to that HER2 expressor cell and the HER2 expressor cell is killed. And so these are antibody drug conjugates and one of the first antibody drug conjugated was a drug called TDM1 which is Herceptin with a microtubule inhibitor called Entensin. So TDM1 came in second line setting and actually realized that those patients who had failed on chemotherapy and Herceptin for whom there would have been no further option but to switch to some other chemo and continue Herceptin we could actually switch to TDM1 and it improved survival. So again, the standard of care was either uh, Herceptin or Chemo, Lepatinib, Capesetamine, these are old drugs. We improved survival. We said, okay, there's a, there's a reasonably good second line option which leads to benefit. In fact, now we have a bumper drug called Trastuzumab Deruxtecan. It's still not available in India. I, I am a PI of a trial for a different setting and I have used it. In fact, this is also antibody drug conjugate. It's been tested in the second line setting and phenomenal results. 
so for those patients who have second line drug the median pfs is 2 years so these patients have failed first line they are actually on second line and the median pfs is 2 years and this is os and they are saying the data is immature but look at this 90% patients are actually alive at about 2 and a half years and this is second line setting and my prediction is that this is a drug which is going to come into first line and my prediction is that this set of metastatic breast cancer patient who present with stage 4 disease we are potentially looking at a median survival i know statistics are difficult median is not average but we are potentially looking at a median survival of anywhere between 6 to 7 years now again i am not a cardiologist but if somebody present with a really bad cardiac disease if that person with a low ef survives as long as a cardiologist i would be very happy i think we are beginning to achieve beginning to look at those kind of results obviously lot of these patients would would progress so there are some new drugs to catenib is an oral drug we talk about injectable drugs this is an oral drug which has led to an improvement in outcomes and not going into the details it seems to have very good activity for those patients who have brain med so for those patients brain med dr charu will probably talk radiation has been one of the go to uh, uh, modalities this drug has a good cns penetration it bypasses the blood brain barrier and shows good intracranial responses so 50% patient will have reduction in disease and then we have other drugs like neratinib improvement in survival and some other antibody drug conjugates including margituximab so i stop here i think i hope i have taken less than 20 minutes but advanced breast cancer um, outcomes are improving i have not talked about triple negative i have not talk, talked about hormone receptor positive in the interest of time we have not just chemotherapy we have monoclonal antibodies we have antibody drug conjugates and we have now oral drugs but i think one of the key piece that is going to change how we treat patients is the piece of precision oncology perhaps in the near future you will give me an opportunity to talk about it thank you very much very much so just like we have uh, anti tumor cell treatment uh, say first line second line third line and god knows how many lines we will have we are having this uh, anti anti cancer treatment first line second line and many other lines so next is our last speaker dr charu gupta she is uh, the spine of uh, radio uh, radio therapy so i uh, radiation therapy so i will hand over the mic to her i am meeting her first time and i hope she will keep her uh, talk short but very interactive thank you thank you dr gandhi thank you dr chandu i'm here so you have heard about uh, the systemic therapies and uh, now i'll talk about talk about radiation and radiation is something which is very localized and uh, and let's see what we have so uh, the most uh, five common cancers in females breast cervix ovary lip oral cavity and colorectal and in males it is lip oral cavity lung stomach colorectal and esophagus so i will be basically talking about what advantages or what are the new things that we have in the treatment of these cancers so first i will go to breast which is the most common cancer in uh, females and if you see why we would need radiation therapy so basically it increases the uh, progression free survival and overall survival and all the females who have had breast conserving surgery radiation becomes mandatory for them and in uh, locally advanced breast cancer even post mastectomy radiation is to be given so uh, what has evolved over the last you know few decades so 1980s we used to give radiation for approximately 6 weeks which is to be you know a uh, lot of inconvenience for the patient so the trials came in in 1998 and then in by 2000 a uh, hypofractionation regimen was established so that means for 3 weeks you come take your radiation and it is over and bcs plus radiation would give you results as equivalent to mastectomy and now uh, when covid struck that was the time then when the fast forward came trial the fast forward trial came where the treatment gets over just in 5 days 
So here you can see on the right, I mean this is what we do, it is an interstitial brachytherapy. So at the time of surgery only these catheters are put. Or else we can, you know, do it by externally via lanar. So it's just a five day treatment. Uh, patient walks in and uh, radiation per se is an OPD procedure. And for the left sided breast cancer, as we know, I mean you have just heard Dr. Devrat that we have long term survivors. So similarly, even in radiation, we don't want any long term morbidity uh, uh, to uh, uh, any long term morbidity with radiation. So there is something called DIVH, which is a deep inspiratory breath hold. In this way, we coach the patient hai to take a deep breath. Here you can appreciate a graph hai where you know, the patient takes a deep breath and holds her breath for around 20 seconds. And what happens as a result, you can see the difference between the heart. So here you can see this is a non-gated, non-deep inspiratory breath hold, which is in our field. And once you are doing it with DIVH, the heart moves away. So this gives a much less dose to the heart and you know, the long term cardiac morbidity is less. Or more patients go that if we are hungry or you know, you are not able to uh, hold your breath for that long. So it doesn't really matter because these are automatic machines and they will you know, uh, gauge that uh, you are losing your breath or you know, you have cough. So they will stop on there. Now this is something very interesting, uh, what we call stereotactic body radiotherapy. So this is almost equivalent to what we call uh, stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. So in this we give a very high dose, which is almost equivalent to the surgery. So here you can see that a marker we put under CT guidance within the tumor. And uh, CT simulation we do on the fifth day, pe karte hai, and again a CT. And here if you can see, so this was a lady who was 73 year old and she refused uh, surgery. She was a stage 1. So um, we, uh, we did radiotherapy for her just in three fractions. Again, an OPD procedure. You go back home. So this is a complex planning, what we do, what our physicists do. And uh, even during radiation, that we call intra-fraction. When the fractions are going on, we have a tumor like lung mate is moving. So you have to monitor how it is moving so that we can monitor and give radiation very precisely. And you can see the results at four months. It is just a small lesion which is there and at 9 months there is a complete disappearance of the lesion. So this is SPRT is something you know which has been you know a boom to our cancer patients. And similarly like uh, what Dr. Devrath was alluding to the brain metastasis. So if you see um, this patient he had uh, lung cancer or those are he had a lesion in the brain. This patient refused again for neurosurgery and we took this patient up for uh, uh, SRS, which is stereotactic radio surgery. Again, something similar to surgery, but again a non-invasive procedure. Again, a single fraction of radiation, and again an OPD procedure. Or SBRT, which you can use any site, use kar sakte, like brain, spine, lung, liver, adrenal, lymph nodes, or bone. So this is a, a gynae case, CS cervix 2B. Or this way, I will just elude that, you know, uh, this is from where we have moved from 2D uh, D era to 4 field to 3D CRT and IMRT. So here you can just appreciate to the left wala hai or you can see the color wash. Jaapi jitna bhi uh, normal organs bhi hai, everything is getting radiation and on the extreme right you can appreciate that we are able to uh, protect the normal structures. So this is how we have evolved over time. And you must have heard about IGI, we call image value radiotherapy. So we do is that radiation is just a CT scan and we fuse the planning CT scan se fuse karte hai while the patient is on the machine. So here you can appreciate that the bladder is so much more uh, uh, filling. Hai isme. And this is the scan that is the rectum blue wala hamara planning CT scan hai. and the next day you can see that the rectum is so over distended. So all these things we can see in IGRD and you know we can uh, tailor our radiation portals accordingly. So this is how even radiation has evolved. And uh, brachytherapy again is a very integral part of CA cervix, CA endometrium, yeah, so recurrent cases hote hai, unke liye bhi. So you can see uh, this is this is what like we place within the uterus and the fornices in CS cervix cases. Jo recurrent cases hote hai, usme we do this uh, something which is called mupid, 
and generally we have, I mean, this photograph, our patient can't even show it because if we show this photograph to the patient, I don't think so. We will ever get a patient to get this procedure done. But uh, this procedure we do very regularly with uh, patients who have got a recurrent disease or very advanced CS or X. So that's it. Very nice and very elaborate talk, Dr. Acharu. Uh, uh, Dr. Aditi has also joined us. Although uh, we are short of time, she will not be uh, giving any talk, but she is welcome. Please come here and uh, be a part of our team. Thank you everyone and uh, I'm sorry I got uh, quite uh, late at work today so I couldn't join you earlier. But I'm glad to see uh, such uh, active participation and such a huge participation actually today. So uh, the, our colleagues Dr. Devrat Arya and Dr. Charu Garg have already spoken uh, to you about breast cancer management. I'm a breast surgeon with Max uh, Institute of Cancer Care Saket and Gurgaon. And I was supposed to talk to you about uh, symptoms of breast cancer. So although I'm not going to go into the talk, I think the only two messages which uh, I, which was my take home message, which I want to tell you all. One is that uh, the talk was about could this be cancer? So basically the symptoms of breast cancer are so common and so uh, subtle at times that the hard, you know, patients who have very obvious findings, they do not get delayed actually. Once they reach any physician, they get referred to an oncology center. It is a problem when patients present at a very young age or where, with very subtle signs. That's when cases get missed. And basically what we want to tell you is that breast cancer can present at any age with any radiology findings with no symptoms or just mild symptoms like just watery or bloody nipple discharge. So it's best not to ignore any lady with breast symptoms and not to forget triple assessment imaging and a core biopsy in all suspicious cases. Yeah, Clinical judgment, unfortunately, is not good enough to exclude cancer in most cases. A mobile lump is not a fibroadenoma. A 30-year-old is not necessarily, you know, safe from cancer. That's about it. And thank you, and please enjoy it. Thank you so much. Just a minute. Uh, my, myself, one minute old uh, I am reminded one of my very senior colleague in one of my uh, interaction had offered that self-breast assessment should be discouraged. So I was uh, appalled. So I, th I thought that this is something to be advocated. That everybody, every female must be educated how to have self-breast uh, examination after at least 40, if not after that and if with a history it can be early. So I want your take home message about self breast examination. Is it a must or it can be a fall fallacious or at times over exaggerated, whatever? So uh, thank you for the question. So self breast examination, if we look at literature, it's not recommended because it can be fallacious, like you said. But in a country like ours with no routine screening guidelines, we must educate women to be breast aware and practice breast self-examination. Although literature will not support it because you will have a lot of women over-reporting, picking up findings which are actually not there. But again, with, because of our resource constraints, breast self-examination, in fact, not after the age of 40. Every adult, every girl above the age of 18, 20, we routinely teach them how to examine their breasts once a month. It's just a matter of habit and once a person gets into the habit, they can go for, you know, uh, pick up any subtle change and report to their consultant on time. Uh, thank you for the uh, carry on message, Dr. Aditi. And uh, just a minute, just a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> That's why I came. I would request Dr. Edmund Kalna, sir, uh, to give this uh, appreciation for this beautiful message to Dr. Aditi. Yeah, now, now it's over to you and, 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 and to everyone to ask questions. Oh, today, like today, 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 today,
I, I want to just convey that like PSA, many people say, ye nahi karna chahi. Ye to bada fallacious hai. Bhai, fallacious hoga, but you have your own mind. So, self-breast examination to me is something, a must. PSA is a must after 50, whatever, and if you are symptomatic. So, I, I open uh, my uh, colleagues, my friends, after a single question from my side, single question, uh, from my uh, the friends, Dr. Charu, as you said that uh, we have SBRT. Can we have all these yeah, 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 I'm, I'm doing it, sir. All, all the um, stalwarts here. Yes. Dr. Chabha, I just can't want to start the ball rolling about SBRT, as you said. I heard about SDRT, Single Dose Radiation Therapy. It was very uh, popular when um, Arjun Rampal's mother had she a breast and she was uh, taken to Portuguese and given SBRT, uh, SDRT and she recovered. So there was a lot of uh, uh, media uh, coverage. Please come in. So it is uh, actually the same like what you said for the result. It is the hub where you know the SBRT started. So basically it is like single fraction where, it, where the region is small. So single dose radiation that is what I said. It's an operating procedure. Count, take it and almost results equivalent to surgery. So single dose is similar to SBRT. Region bada hota hai to ek bari ki jagya usme ek bari three or five fractions mein But results are same. So I'll, I'll give the mic to Dr. Tulsi and my other friends because I'm I'm a moderator. I will keep myself moderate. <laughs> Please have a seat, uh, Dr. Kalra, and thank you for the deliberation. Uh, let me start with Dr. Manish since he was the opening batsman. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Manish, happiness is home for this child. Yes. Very well said, sir. Tell us a little about the ASA class 1, 2, 3 and 4 for this time. ASA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and there is something called E also. So ASA stands for American Society of Anesthesiologists. They have given a classification according to severity of the disease. This is not for the patient. It's basically for the anesthesiologist to anesthesiologist who is giving over to another anesthesiologist saying that this patient is ASA 1 means this patient is not having any coexisting diseases other than this disease what for what he is being operated other than that he is not having any coexisting disease that is ASA 1 similarly ASA 2, 3 and 4, 5 keep on increasing ASA 5 is brain dead patient coming for organ, organ donation and if there is written capital E it means it is an emergency procedure I don't want to explain everything, or should I explain everything? That's okay. okay. That's okay. So, uh, probably Dr. Arya, we have listened to you in the past also, and uh, wonderful deliberation. So, Dr. Arya, will there ever be a cure for MBC? We know that the quality of life and longevity probably is, you know, is treatable but not curable. So, 5 years survival, 22% and probably mean is about 3 years. What do you say, sir? I think that's a fair point. Uh, I think breast is now a multitude of disease rather than a single cancer. So, we see a lot of ER and BR positive breast cancer. So, actually, when you look at the 5 years survival, are actually in the range of 40-45%. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum is the triple negative breast cancer, which was so aggressive. That even in this day and age, even with the advent of immunotherapy, the median survival is about 18 years. Will there be a cure? I think time will tell. I always joke with my endocrinology friends, my peers, uh, please find a cure for diabetes, hypertension, and then I'll talk about cure about MBC. But, sir, uh, very rightly, sir, I think what we are trying to do is improve survival with time. And I think increase the number of people who are alive at five years, and that percentage seems to be steadily growing. Can you throw some light on the latest uh, antibody, you know, drug conjugate? 
You talked about that briefly. Can you show the title that, please? So uh, they are. And referring to the NHL two. Yes. So. And number two is trust is not deductible and that we right, talked about. Right. Yes. Right. And this That's is. That's the latest. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this is. Uh, Trastuzuma, which is Herceptin, which we've been traditionally using, right. with a Topfer inhibitor, which is a chemotherapy drug. And as we said, the antibody drug conjugate actually helps in a targeted drug delivery, where only the tumor cell will end up receiving the chemotherapy, and therefore the normal cell will not express her to be not. Yeah. Right. So there are a lot of interest. Uh, some of the first studies came three years back, where there were astounding results. Last year in our uh, one of our major conferences, ESPO, uh, we had a second line study which compared this drug with the then standard of care TDM1, which is also antibiotic conjugate. And I showed the results, the median progression piece survival. So the median had a median of 25 months, 50 percent of patient to progression fee. One of the unique things, and which is crossing some barriers in breast cancer. Is that while we talk about these drugs who are Hertunu 3 plus, which is traditionally considered positive, there's also now a recognition of a set of patients who are Hertu low, and this is a new I mean new term that we're introducing. So they are Hertunu negative, Hertunu positive, and Hertunu low, which are intermediate between these two, and we believe that even those Hertu low, this drug may be able to bind. And there may be a bystander effect. And as I said, I'm one of the PIs of the clinical trial for her to loop. So as I said, my prediction is this seems to be a bumper drug. Uh, this could be potentially a first-line drug in a few years. For whatever little usage we've had, one of the key problems with this drug has been ILD. So we've had one, one and a half, two percent severe ILDs, and that's why I think the uptake of this drug, especially during COVID, has been a little slower. But again, it seems to be a very, very promising. So, 1 to 2 percent is hardly anything. So, Nagarya, tell us a little about the triple negative uh, tumors. Hardest to treat and probably hardest, you know, the worst prognosis. So, any role of the cancer immunotherapy is here? Yes, so uh, I was not able to share in the interest of time. Uh, again, since they do not express ER, PR, HER2 new, we right. don't have any targets and the traditional therapy has been key. As, as we were discussing, the median survival has been about 12 to 18 months. Very frustrating to us. Unfortunately, most of the younger women present with triple negative. And most of the older women present with ER, PR positive. And I, I personally believe that we see a lot more triple negatives here in India. I think our figure is somewhere about 25-30% juxtaposed to 20% in the West. Now, uh, there's been a lot of interest about immunotherapy and we've been using it for... That's been a game changer now for the, this, this uh, particular yes. sort of so, this thing. Yes. Cancer. Yeah. So, yes. so what yeah. we realized was that PDL one which is a chemical secreted by a lot of tumors, is a biomarker of response. And we had this drug called atezolizumab, which is a which is an immunotherapy drug which is used in a lot of cancers which when combined to chemotherapy in the first line setting for those patients who are expressing PDL1 actually led to an improvement in survival. In fact, when the drug was launched and when the antibody was launched, I was one of the first one here in North India to use it. And that patient is still alive at wow. two and a half years. Wow. Still alive. And, 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 years. and still progression free. So still on immunotherapy maintenance. Uh, there's another approval called pembrolizumab which seems to be beneficial. But yes, potentially game changer. And this was the triple negative uh, Okay. So, Dr. Charu. Yes. So, uh, what do you say now the proton therapy now considered the uh, the mainstream treatment? What do you say? So, uh, in certain cases... You can talk about the proton therapy. Uh -huh. Because we don't have it here. And okay. it is still... I, mean, I no. believe uh, probably Apollo has started. Only uh, one Apollo Chennai. Chennai. Apollo Apollo Chennai. Chennai, yeah. Chennai. Chennai. started. Uh -huh. We attended a conference. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Apollo Chennai has started. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, till now, even in certain cancers, like especially brain tumors, yeah, uh, you know, the uh, benign tumors, there it is coming in a big way. For other uh, sites, it is still, you know, investigation. Whether when you, it's basically a cost and uh, benefit ratio. I mean, one treatment there would cost you something like 30-35 lakhs. 
which otherwise even at the best center would cost you around 3 lakhs. So it's almost 10, 15 times more, okay. you know, uh, than the conventional. Okay. But then, I mean, re-radiation, our certain, you know, brain tumors, where it really makes a uh, difference in pediatric patients. I think that is the place where, you know, proton should be uh, done. Okay, what about the PSMA PET, you know, for uh, prostate, prostate cancer care? Ah, so that comes under the preview of nuclear medicine and PSMA PET CT is something which is very specific to the... It's changed the way you treat and diagnose the prostate cancer now. Yes. So that picks up, that because that would pick up any, you know, PSA secreting tumor anywhere in the body. Dr. Adhiti, final bit to you. So, uh, the two most commonest cause of lungs are in the breast are the fibrocystic breast and the cyst and the cysts. So, are there some uh, are there some risk factors <coughs> which probably probably progress to cancer? Uh, I'm probably talking about the genetic mutations of BRCA one and two, and also the family history. Yes. Dr. John, can you have some science yeah, yeah. in the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, those who are speaking can come in front. Kindly, you can come in front and ask questions. I think <laughs> it, it will serve both the purposes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. So, uh, there were two parts to your question. One about uh, benign causes of lumps in the breast. Yes, benign. Commonest, two commonest causes of breast uh, lumps. Yeah. So, basically, fibrocystic disease is a term which we don't use now. Basically, we call it ANDI. We say that they are aberrations of normal development and involution. They are just hormonal changes. They can be fibrodenosis, they can be fibrodenomas, just uh, lactational induced changes. We just use the term ANDI for it and try to not use the term fibrosis. Can you disease. repeat that? You ANDI, that is aberrations of normal development and involution. Okay. So basically, a woman during her reproductive age group, between the age group of 15 to 50, will undergo some changes and all these fall into that spectrum. So, do they convert into cancer? No. Uh, various studies have shown that the relative risk is somewhere up, just pointed to one. Basically, they do not get converted to cancer at all. What can happen is that they may be misdiagnosed as a benign cause, and later on, the patient might feel that it got converted, but they don't get converted per se. As far as the second part of your question is concerned about, you know, what are the risk factors, genetic, like BRCA and family history. So, 90% of our breast cancer patients do not report a positive family history. Only 5 to 10% cancer patients have a positive family history or have a known genetic cause. BRCA, there can be a lot of uh, genetic mutations which can be disposed to breast and other cancers. BRCA 1 and 2 are the most common mutations and they are the ones which are often heard and talked about because they predispose to not only to breast but to ovarian, pancreatic and a variety of other cancers and they significantly increase the risk. There are various screening protocols for such families but I would uh, like to you know just stop there but yes anyone with a very strong family history, families who have multiple family members with cancers should be worked out for genetic problems. So my last question Dr. Diti. So, uh, male breast cancer, see 1 in 100? 1% of all breast cancer, so for 100 women breast cancer patients, there might be one male breast cancer. Right. And so, what is the greatest risk factors? Probably two, Klenfelter syndrome mm -hmm. and uh, uh, chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. Are these the two biggest factors? for? Yes. Yes. So any um, these will cause because hormonal increase estrogen and, and slow androgens and even BRCA. Thank you. Thank you. Ask, ask, ask. So, uh, Doctor Arya, uh, when you say triple negative or yeah negative or HER2 negative, is it absolute or it depends on certain percentage? It is twenty percent positive or fifty percent positive like that. So the cutoffs are different. Yes. For a curative setting, we have defined ER expression of less than 1%, PR expression less than 1% to be defined as what? ER, PR negative. And for her to new to be uh, anything but 3 plus or negative by fish. So her to new positive is IHC, 3 plus expression, but a strong homogeneous expression of 30% of cells. 
or fish positive. So that's certainly positive. So anything which is ER, ER, by the those definition less than 1%, no, HER2 you not 3 plus and not fish positive, that's to So fish you do when uh, HER2 is in doubt? So when HER2 is 2 plus, uh, there's a 20% possibility of a fish test actually showing it to be positive. But so, you know, fish is the genetic expression. HER2 is, IHC is the protein on the surface of the cell. So, uh, so there is a 20% possibility that a HER2 to 2 plus will be positive. And uh, the best prognosis is for ERPR positive and HER2 negative, is it right? Yes, absolutely. And Strong ERPR positive, so we have also... And uh, HER2 negative, this is the best one. And triple positive is worse than that. But so, so but if I had to rate, yeah. ERPR strong positive, HER2 negative the best, is the best. Yeah. ERPR HER2 positive, second best. ERPR negative, HER2 positive, third best and triple negative is the best. And Dr. Raya, in your daycare cases, suppose you have uh, taken a patient of lab body for daycare. Yes. And at, uh, at 5 o'clock you decide the patient is not fit to go. Then what do you do? We will discharge the patient at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and at 6 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, if, if he is not fit to go then? Yes, sir. Worst possible case. But in the, my question is, have you ever faced a situation that at the time of closure of your clinic at Max Punchy, you have decided this patient has to be shifted? Yes. So that is the question. Okay. I got your question. If 5 or 6 is not important, the patient shifting is important. Yes. Okay. I got your question. Yes. Generally, pre-operative period only, we explain our patient that we are going to discharge you on the same day. So, pre briefing the patient pre-operatively always helps in discharging the patient. Patient will be motivated to go home. In, so, we have that approximately 89 laparoscopic cholecystectomy on daycare basis till now. Not a single patient was shifted to hospital for overnight stay. So, somehow we are managing, sir. And we are not shifting the patient for overnight stay. You are in Max Punchy since its beginning? I am joined Max Punchy in 2013. Okay. So I day. know many patients who were shifted to Max Sakit, but anyway, <coughs> it may be before you came to Max Punchy. Uh, then 2013, Max sir, we have shifted few patients, yes. not, but not with lab bully. Few ENT patients were shifted because of uh, post operative bleeding was there in one of the patients. One of the patients refused to go home. Yeah, I don't want to go home. You know, no. many of the centers which started as a daycare center, Jeez. they were ultimately patient found, uh, found it comfortable that they would like to stay. So they converted it to overnight stay center. Short stay, okay, short stay or whatever you call it. This is my experience. Exactly. And it is always patient find it, I am a surgeon, patient find it comfortable, they will go home next time. Uh, so they will like to stay over I have operated to patients at yes, the yes, sir. I was but, an anesthesiologist for yeah, you. I know, but many patients, it's very good center, I agree. But the patient psychology, you whatever you say before admission, after admission, patient sometimes say, okay, now I would like to stay, I am only vomiting. And this is the problem in we'll daycare. That's the art to manage things, sir. Yeah. It's not all about science. If you keep on talking with the patient in pre-operative and during operation and post-operative period, patient will be more comfortable. The good part about Max Hospital Panchi Park, we are only two anesthesiologists there. And uh, during the stay, at least we will meet the patient five to six times. So they are very comfortable with us. So if you tell he, you have to go home, you have to do this thing, if you will not do this thing, you will not be able to go home. If you keep on motivating them, they will be able to go home. So. Prior to that patient selection, as you said, is very Patient selection is very important. Very if strong... Sir, so just uh, extension of your question. If some someone has a, a insurance compulsion, that you have one night stay in a hospital. So it's an exclusion no, from your side? No. That is a different issue. No, sir. That's, that's all, that's way. all almost insurance company they are, are, take care. That is are taking care of daycare patients. Yeah, that is take in, daycare they, in fact, they are more happy if their patients are getting operated on daycare basis, they have to pay less and they are more happy. 20 percent. Uh, Dr. Devrat, uh, we talk beautifully about the uh, late stage cancers and breast cancers and you know, uh, my uh, very simple question is, do we have a national policy of screening and detecting cancers early? 
a national policy like national tuberculosis control program, national malaria eradication program. Do we have a national cancer control program? So we have a national cancer control program. How, and, and are you a part of that? So we are, we are a part of NCRP program. So we are sitting in a private setup. So there are three aspects to cancer care. Obviously, one is funding, which is the government funding most of the medical colleges. From the last where I was aware, the government was willing to finance up to 5 CR for each medical college for a cancer uh, treatment center. And most of that funding went to uh, finance the radiation machines, correct me if I'm wrong. So all medical colleges are supposed to be equipped with cancer equipment. I think the second aspect has been, what about you know, people who are treating cancers. And I think what we have learnt is uh, the super specialty courses have been lacking in our country and that's why a lot of general surgeons, general physicians, radiation therapists have had to contribute to uh, treatment of cancer. But I think uh, in 2010 uh, with Dr. Sareen coming in, he realized that, you know, we need more professionals in this field because we are having 15, 16 new, uh, 15, 16 lakh new cancer cases every year and, and the number of professionals coming out started increasing the number. Now, do we participate in that? We don't participate formally. We participate in the National Cancer Registry Program. So, what we are saying is, we are at step one. We are trying to generate accurate data as to what is the actual number of patients who get diagnosed each year, how many of these are, have access or eventually end up receiving treatment, what stages that they present with, what is the epidemiological profile and what are the outcomes. That is what we are contributing to. We, we are national level advocates uh, for for creation of policy. A lot of our senior members are part of committees which create policies. We are huge participants in NGOs. I mean, I'm not here to talk about that, but uh, you'll see a lot of uh, participation by surgeons who don't charge a fee and, and actually do uh, subsidized cancer surgery, particularly for pediatric cancers. And uh, obviously, I think we have a lot, lot of way to go. Now to screening, I don't think we, think we have the infrastructure for screening yet. We are struggling to treat. And once we are able to treat most of our patients, that's when we'll stop, talk about screening. So screening in India has to be individual driven rather than government driven. And that's why when, when I hear uh, Dr. Kadra asking ki self rest examination ki importance West mein nahi hai because waap screening hai. Hamare ya screening nahi hai. So it's, it's very important. Similarly, PSA. West, when you look at that data, it's probably not relevant, but for India, when it's an individual driven uh, screening, yes, it remains as relevant as, as any other test. Sir, uh, what I understood from the talk and many talks that I have heard from you and from other members are there are four cancers that we as physicians should be very, very careful about. One is lung cancers, second is breast cancers, third is prostate cancers and fourth you could keep any of the cancers the other cancers you know the lymph nodes the undiagnosed lymph nodes or the oral cancers as you are pointing out for lung cancers what is the basic screening tool that a physician you know who have come here 50 in number should keep in their mind so that they are able to screen at least 70 80 you have to separate your patient into those who are heavy smokers and those who are not heavy smokers and, and we all know about pack years and 30 pack years as some, some way, a cutoff which defines heavy smokers from non-heavy smokers. For heavy smokers, a low a contrast or a non-contrast CT scan is what is recommended. This is what will pick up, you know, most of these uh, nodules which may be suspicious. For those patients who do, are not heavy smokers, unfortunately there is no screening. But I think we, all of us discuss it in our CMEs that any respiratory symptom which is lasting for more than 2 to 3 weeks could be a potential marker for a chronic condition, chronic infection, one of them could be a cancer. Dr. Gupta, I am coming to you sir for questions. <laughs> I am coming to you, don't worry, I am coming to you. Yeah, yeah. So, just keep silence for 5 years. And I think eventually once you have a solitary pulmonary nodule, correct evaluation, investigation of a solitary pulmonary nodule is also very important because you cross one step, you actually identified something and then to you know categorize it correctly is also important. So what is the basic screening tool for breast cancer? So basic... So uh, for breast cancer, screening 
only mammogram is recommended in an average risk individual. So if you don't talk about people with BRCA or a strong family history, above the age of 40, mammograms are recommended once a year or once in two years, the guidelines vary. This is between the age of 40 to 70. Less than 40, routine screening is not recommended. In high risk individuals with known BRCA mutations, I screening should start at from the age of 25 actually and then we use mammogram and MRI alternatively. Right. Suppose I have a documented case of fibroadenosis, bilateral breast. Yeah. Biopsy proven. Mm. Now how regularly should I follow up this patient with mammography mm. and when should I consider a re-biopsy? Yeah. So fibroadenosis, so this is basically for all our breast cases we rely on triple assessment that is clinical exam, imaging and uh, tissue diagnosis with a biopsy preferably. Uh, the test, the imaging test to follow up a patient with biopsy proven fibrosis, basically uh, if you are absolutely certain then that patient does not need regular follow up. The problem is that normally these patients will have a BIRADS 3 on their imaging. If they are less than 40 they would have gotten an ultrasound done, if they are more than 40 they would have gotten a mammogram done. If there is a BIRADS 3 on imaging, and you've got a biopsy for some reason and it's a fibroidosis, then you repeat, you follow her up at six months for two years and then you relegate her to an average risk individual's follow up. So you don't need to follow up with imaging for the rest of her life. Once her imaging is BIRADS 2, she does not need regular follow up, it's only on an SOS basis. If she's above 40, then obviously once a year mammogram. Right. Uh, Ma'am, you talked about the radiation and uh, uh, Dr. Tulsi asked the question and you said that that particular uh, technique is available in Apollo proton. Gen, uh, the, the, the proton. When is MEX going to get proton? Ma'am, such a big institute, uh, the hospital with the largest bed strength and I think it is in the pipeline, the talks are going on because it is a very heavy investment. Uh, for a proton therapy. There is no dearth of malignancy in India, man. Very, very true. So it is in the pipeline. I'll share, you, share with you a very interesting. So there was a publication two years back in Journal of Clinical Oncology, which comes from the US, and they looked at proton therapy and the cost effectiveness of proton therapy in the US, and they said it's not cost effective. So uh, I think I think in India, the the right way is the right. Uh, case selection. Now, just because something is available for a small advantage, probably not worth it. And in fact, a lot of us see patients where we do feel that a proton is needed, and we actually tell them because our pass join now probably may not be that good enough. You should actually go and seek proton therapy. So that case selection is very important. So best, best case just a minute. So so the best. The best screening tool, Dr. Devrat Arya, still remains a good history and clinical examination. Triple exam. Yes. No, no, no. Forget triple, sir. Routine, good examination. Okay. Sir, as a physician, when a patient comes to me, I have to use my clinical judgment to understand the history. For example, in lung cancer, smoking history, a lot of people are not forthcoming about it. Symptomatic history. A good clinical examination, that's when I will order the next set of tests. And that's why, you know, all of us, can't forget that while imaging becomes a lot more easier and is supplanting examination, examination history will never be superseded by any image. Right, so my last question. The prognosis of male breast cancer versus female breast cancer? Much better. Male breast cancer? Yes. Yeah, because traditionally they are more ER and PR positive. Okay. So as I said, breast cancer is not one disease now, it's multiple different diseases. So A, it's diagnosed early. You pick it up early because a small lump will also manifest itself. 80 to 90 percent of these uh, tumors are ER and PR positive, and uh, very few are HER2 new positive. I think one person who should ask a question is Dr. P.K. Mangla. Big hand for Dr. P.K. Mangla. <laughs> Dr. P.K. Mangla is an eminent uh, pulmonologist, and wha what we should be thankful to him is the wonderful service that he gave us during the COVID times. Day in and day out, I was waiting always. Specifically to lung malignancies, I want to know 
over the he has been one of the oldest practitioners of uh, chess. I think Dr. Devrath, you must have been born and must have been in your Lakers when he started, when he bought the first bronchoscope in South Delhi. Lakers chess, RSS. No, no, RSS. No, what is what? This one of us. Just to clarify, I was born in 78. So, पता भी लेकर इसमें भी खा के नहीं था। मेरे इसकी शादी भी हुई थी कि नहीं हुई कुछ तो बड़े। Anyway, so I was just you know regarding these hand cancers. I think very deadly cancers. Just to cite an example, they they came with the low dose CT. I think it created more confusion than diagnosing cases. Confusion was that if you are doing that, you will keep on getting some nodules, some nodules. And the patient will live for the rest of his life in the doubt that cancer is not. Again, you know, one of our doctor colleagues, he just came to me, he said, first of all, this round was done in 12 minutes, in 9 minutes, now I think it's about 12 minutes, in the morning walk. And he was very concerned. Some of the colleagues said, you have to sit down. Left upper lobe, there was a small nodule, some speculated. The best of the radiologist said that yeah, yeah, most likely na, Purani TB ka scar hai. But suddenly you need a biopsy. So uh, it was done, you know, failed, then true cut biopsy done, adenosia. Adenosia, it was negative, surgery done, and the surgeon said, you disease. He is disease free, he receives chemotherapy, and he was not required to be have, have chemotherapy, but Shayat the ignored unilateral positive thought. He had chemotherapy. After that, a big Fidse Karanoya pet brain mass. Go I think he spent a crore of rupee, and, and every time he was in tension, and it was brain mats. In spite of radiotherapy, killed him. So uh, the point was that even after diagnosing this cancer so early, and the MRI, un unfortunately, they operated him without doing an MRI on the basis of PET, which was negative. But second PET caused, uh, caught the brain So uh, PET MRI. Just uh, I'll tell you another thing that there was a patient who had who was a heavy smoker. उसको बंजर और जल सब हो गया और सिगरेट भी छोड़ता था जो कास्टी हो गया तो एक उसका ऐसी खांसी ठीक नहीं हो रही है एस्मा भी था तो सीटी करा लिया सीटी बस दें एक ईयर लेटर यू नो ही डेवलप असीए लंग विथ नोट्स ऑन द राइट साइड ही वेंट टू द बेस्ट सर्जन इन मुंबई गोट ऑपरेटेड ट्वेल्व मार्च you know, not even a pin head or a pin head, it was a tip of the size, a nodule in one area, and right there was the cancer. So such is a deadly cancer lung, the only thing I think the prevention is the best part, rather than getting engaged into, because the moment you find it, that there is a cancer, I have hardly seen people getting operated. But with the newer advents of these chemotherapy, you know, Japtinib and all the drugs, I think they have changed the scene. And regarding the breast cancer, with all your, uh, all your drugs, what is the role of surgery now? Sir, so surgery depends. So for, in fact, no, as a medical oncologist, no, as a medical oncologist I, think, I think we have not been able to replace surgery so far. In fact, uh, I think last year, last to last year, Last, last year there was a trial which was presented where they said you give new and joint chemotherapy, you do a biopsy, you do an MR, everything is negative. And then you try and see whether you could have avoided surgery, so irrespective of uh, whatever the results are, you would operate. You realize that even with a negative imaging and a negative biopsy, on a surgery you actually found viable tumor cells that if you had not operated upon would have grown with time. So as of now for stage 1, 2, 3, Surgery is one of the pillars of treatment and whatever be the kind of chemotherapy I may offer or radiation she may offer, her role will be That's number one. I think the, the, the other thing we have questioned is, 
you know, stage migration is happening. So you are asking about PSM pet ka kya asar hai? I think that after PSM pet ke baad stage 4 ka roof survive ho jayega. Isliye ki bahut saare PSM pet stage 4 pe pick karega, jo ki convention bolte hain nahi karna. So with newer modalities, you have more stage migration. So you would have now have with the advent of pet a lot of patients who would have otherwise been labeled stage 3 operated received chemotherapy radiation would be labeled as stage 4. And we are trying to identify a subset of patients who are oligometastatic limited stage disease and see if we can be more aggressive with our treatment and surgery also. Now that's been a area which is still a grey zone. I think literature still says no role for surgery but I think in a select population there may be a problem. Sir, my question would be valid only if I heard it correctly because I was sitting at the back but I heard one of the panel, panel panelists here say that we are using proton therapy for benign tumors. Did I hear it right? Okay, so what kind of benign tumor and why, why would you like to give radiotherapy to a benign tumor? Yeah, so like your vestibular schwannomas is one place where... Yeah, yeah. So that is one place where we give it. Then there are meningiomas, benign meningiomas. Then there are AVMs, cavernomas. So these are few of the benign conditions where, you know, radiation has to be given to sort of curb the growth of that, uh, you know, growing tumor. Otherwise, it's also, you know, compression over the normal structures like, you know, this tumor will cause, a, a com, a, you know, compression over the brain stem and AVMs as such would, uh, can bleed. So, these are few of the places where we do give, uh, you know, radiation in benign. There are a lot of others like even keloids where we give radiation. Uh, I think, uh, friends, uh, 10.35. Like so, proton, the main advantage of proton is that it is more precise. So, I mean, if there is something called a brad peak, so the brad peak goes into the tumor and, you know, it comes down like this. Wherever in an x-ray it would come like this. So, there would have, there has, there, there's an exit dose when we use x-ray. tissue sparing. Just a minute. Uh, I think, uh, friends, all of you would agree that uh, uh, all our speakers deserve a big hand. for wonderfully uh, conveying their message.